Today we'll be walking through how to create this slime mold animation in Blender 3.6a using simulation nodes. There's a link to the project files in the description, so check that out if you'd like, and let's get started. There are two objects in this scene, a simulation object and a camera object. The simulation object houses the geometry nodes modifier for the actual simulation, as well as a subdivide and a curve to mesh modifier that are used for rendering and we'll go over later. To start off, we've got the initialization of the simulation. And what that does is it takes a grid as a source for the distribution of particles, which are the basis of the simulation. Um, you convert those points to vertices, and then you store a named attribute called extrude. This is a Boolean attribute, and what it does is it marks the ends of each of these strands as extrude, and that's used within the simulation to only extrude the mesh along the points that need to grow rather than through every single point that exists. Um, I also store this named attribute called age, which I'm going to delete because I'm not actually using it and I have I just didn't delete it yet. Moving on to the meat of the simulation, the first thing that we do is we store a named attribute called last position. This is a vector attribute on points and it just stores the position of the point at this current place and time. Later we're going to use that to update a velocity attribute which we haven't initialized yet but I'll explain in just a moment. Um, by subtracting the current position of the point by this last position attribute. So hopping into the first node group called extrude mesh, we'll see that this is a pretty simple little network and what it does is it just extrudes the mesh uh, by the points that are marked as extrude only and uh, with an offset of the velocity attribute. Now we didn't initialize the velocity attribute in the initialization step and the reason for that is because when I was creating this, I didn't do it. And I got some results that I really liked. And then I tried adding some random values to the velocity attribute for the initialization. And it just didn't turn out the same. Um, you'll see that right at the beginning here, you kind of lose a lot of the initial points and they start growing out. And, you know, if I wanted to be really, really technically rigorous, I would put that in and figure out how to make it do what I wanted it to do, but I kind of like the way it looks, so, you know, happy accidents. After we extrude the mesh, we go into these two sense and react node groups. So what these do is they merge the geometry by a certain merge distance, and then based off of that, they move either away from or towards that merged value position depending on this move away property. So if we hop into this group, we'll see that we have a merge by distance node, which merges the geometry by the merge distance. So if we take a look at this strand here, if the merge distance is larger than the thickness of this line, then this will get merged into one single line, kind of like that, sort of. And then what happens is you get the geometry proximity of the source position to the merged position. So let's say the source position is up here. The merged position is right there. And then really what we're doing is we're getting the vector from the source position um, or the vector from the merged position to the source position. So this vector right here. And then we're scaling that by the move away value to get the either uh, attractive or repulsive force. So if this move away value is negative, then we'll move towards that point. And if it's positive, we'll move away, like this arrow right here. And the size of that move away value just determines the magnitude of that movement. You'll notice that we also have this less than boolean node and this switch node over here and what that's doing is it's just only moving the source geometry by the vector that we've determined if it's within the merge distance radius of the merge geometry. So it takes in the distance between the source geometry and the merge geometry and if that is less than the merge distance then this switch statement evaluates to true and so we end up using the scaled vector that we determined here 
rather than a zeroed out vector, so no movement, for the offset value of the set position node. So jumping back out into the outer node group, we have these two sense and react nodes, and they have different values associated with them. One is attractive, so the move away value is negative, and one is repulsive, so the move away value is positive, and then the merge distances are also different. So the merge distance of the attractive force is larger than the merge distance of the repulsive force. And so what that does is it takes geometry that's kind of farther away from, from each other and brings it together. And then the geometry that's closer sort of repels itself. So you get these effects where the geometry kind of attracts towards itself without completely merging. So if I took out this repulsive force, then you're going to kind of see the geometry just get closer and closer together. Here, I had to restart the simulation for that to actually work. But it just kind of merges and, and turns into a stringy mess of nothing. So that repulsive force is really important so that um, you, you get the desired effect. So now for the last couple of nodes in the simulation, you go into the update velocity node group. And what that does is it just takes the position of the current geometry and the last position, which remember we set at the beginning of the simulation. And then it subtracts the current position from the last position. It normalizes that, which makes the magnitude 1. And then it scales that by a scale input, which is just something that we determine. That actually should be sort of a specific value. Um, there's a reason why this value is piped in both to this scale attribute and the resample curve node. And we'll go over that in a second. So it scales the uh, normalized value of the current position from the last position by that scale value. And then it updates the velocity attribute based off of uh, a mix with the last velocity. So the reason why we've got this vector mix node is because we don't want to just go straight to the new velocity calculated by the position, the current position, and the last position. We want to sort of keep a little bit of the velocity from before. And so we just have the uh, attribute, the velocity attribute node here. And we, um, we just mix between those two values by a factor of 0.5. And that's something that you can change and mess with and, and see what you like. But this is what I came up with. Then we convert the mesh to a curve. And we do this for the differential growth properties of the simulation. So you see, as this grows, um, the geometry is moving. And we need to add geometry to make sure that we just don't get these long lines uh, with vertices that are very far apart from each other and long edges, edges in between. And so the way we do that is we convert the mesh to a curve so we can resample the curve by a certain length. And before I was saying that it is important that this length is the same as the velocity value. And that's because if this length was larger then that velocity value, then as you move and extrude the mesh based off of the velocity attribute, it's only going to move a little bit. And then the resample curve is going to kind of negate that movement. And so you want to make sure that length is about the same, or this length could be even a little less than that. But it works to have it uh, e exactly the same as well. And so then the last step here or the last two steps, are that we store the extrude Boolean attribute based off of this curve tip node. And so we're just selecting the uh, tip selection. And what that does is it just finds the end of the curve. So whatever is the end point, that's what we're going to extrude the mesh from in the next iteration of the simulation. And so that attribute is set here. And then we just convert the curve back to a mesh so we can restart the loop the way that we started. And that is it for the simulation geometry node network. So the other two modifiers we have are this subdivide modifier, which just sort of smooths out these curves when you turn it on. So I've just got that marked for render. 
and then this curve to mesh geometry node group which actually creates the mesh that will get rendered um, in Eevee which is the renderer that we're using in this case. So the way this node group works is it converts the mesh to a curve it sets that curve radius just to a certain curve radius in this case it's just one um, and then it actually sets the curve radius of the tip of the curve to zero so that you get this um, nice point or else it would be sort of capped like that um, and then it converts that curve to a mesh with an arc so if you look at the geometry up close you'll see that it's sort of a hemisphere instead of a full circle. Now you could use a circle curve primitive node if you wanted to make this 3D but for this case to reduce the amount of geometry that I actually need I'm just gonna do an arc with a resolution of 5. Now it's important that you set the resolution to a specific value because if you're rendering something that's got a different material than what I have here which is just an emissive material then you're going to get rendering artifacts if the lines create faces that point directly up. So where those intersect, you'll get Z fighting. So just make sure that's to um, an odd value or a value where there is a edge running directly through the top. Just a little tip there. And then you convert, oh, you've already converted that curve back to a mesh with the arc as the profile curve and then you set the material to the material that we're going to use for rendering. Quickly to go over the material go back into camera view and rendered mode and then if we go to the shader editor we see that we've got a super super simple material which is just a completely white emission shader and a white transparent shader mixed together with a value that I've just sort of found one that I like and the reason I do this is because if you mix all the way to emissive or you just have like a single emissive shader in there it's just gonna kinda be fully white and you lose some of the nice detail with the values kind of adding up uh, where the lines overlap and you just wanna pull that slider to a point that you think is nice what I had it before was 784 but it just completely depends on what you like and one other rendering detail is that I have the color management set to filmic and very high contrast so you might be wondering what if I want this to be a 3d effect so this here is just 2d and you'll see the rendering happening just on this plane but if you notice in the simulation network there's actually nothing that clamps it to that surface it's just because we start on that plane and then the velocity is updated based off of the proximity of the geometry to the merge geometry which is all going to lie on this xy plane it just doesn't move in the z direction but what we can do if we want to turn it to 3d is we can initialize the velocity to actually have a z value so if we store a named attribute type vector on point called velocity and then I just add a small amount there let me turn off the meshing then you'll see right at the beginning these points are moving straight up and if you let the simulation run you've got your 3d simulation and so you can initialize that to all sorts of values you can constrain it based off of a surface or um, a different boundary condition there's a whole lot of possibilities of adding noise to the velocity um, you can animate those things over time in the project files for this tutorial I'll also provide an example of a 3d setup that I've tuned to be cool or what I think is cool at least and also one that conforms the simulation to the surface of a mesh so I think that just about covers it and as always, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you learned something. And above all, I hope you had fun. Until next time, bye.